In this video, I'm going to be talking about how I use Jumpluff to become the number one rated Pokemon player in the world. If you guys enjoy this kind of content, please be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Thank you guys for checking out the video. Let's get right into it. So for this section, I kind of want to talk about how I came upon using this team and how I ended up running it. So basically at Fort Wayne Regional Championships, I ended up getting second place, not with the team that I'm going to be talking about today, but I ended up getting second place at the event. Now within the tournament run at the event, I actually ended up playing versus a player uh, who's called Justin Knox. Um, his username online is 45 mice and his team was actually really intriguing to me because it was a team that even though um, had finished 10 and four and had in top cut, I felt like actually was pretty strong. And when I played versus it, it actually exerted a lot of pressure versus me. So it made me very intrigued in this idea because it looked so strong overall as a concept that I felt like it had some potential. So going into EUIC, which was the next big international tournament, I still ended up bringing the same team that I used in Fort Wayne and didn't do as hot as I wanted to. And with the Portland regionals coming up, which was a really big deal for me because I was basically title defending. I really wanted to be able to win and I felt like Sun could be a really good team to kind of give me the potential to win the game or like win the tournament, I guess, not the game, but like win the tournament, right? Because it had a lot of good offensive options, but there were a couple things with this original build, which I didn't really like, which ended up being things that I would change in going into my own original version, right? Or first version, I should say. Now, I obviously didn't just want to go straight into it without any testing, so I made sure to play a couple of tournaments that would give me some good experience with the team and figure out what I like. So some of the main changes that I made immediately, which I'll pull up here, um, were changing the Torkoal to Fissure over Yawn so I could exert immediate pressure, was changing the, um, I believe I changed, yes, the Flutter Main to Terra Fairy so that I could output more damage with my Flutter and also to, uh, that was pretty much it, right, for the original changes. I also made uh, the V spreads on my own. I didn't use any of the V spreads from the original team. I wanted to kind of put my own spin on it and use spreads that I was familiar and comfortable with. So this is the first version I ended up bringing. And what do you know? Boom! I ended up I ended up winning the Victory Road tournament. Um, to be fair, before this tournament, I did also play the Global Challenge 2, um, which awarded some points for the circuit. And it just gave me some practice, right, um, with this team that I got familiar with. But at this point, um, like after the Global Challenge 2, I felt really good about the team, right? And uh, then, you know, playing the team in Victory Road and being able to win, the team was really strong. So it felt like a really good team overall. And it gave me a lot of confidence going into Portland, right? So going into portland i didn't really make any changes because the version that i used felt really strong the only change that i made going into portland was i gave my chin pal taunt instead of giving it a sacred sword now why did i do this so within the victory road tournament run which i played i actually ended up playing versus a terra water amoongus multiple times or a couple terra water amoonguses where i kind of had to rely on not staying asleep versus Spore Amoongus, right? So I really just had to kind of just do my best to output as much damage as possible and kind of just force myself to eat the sleeps. So I kind of wanted to clean up a lot of those approaches because I felt like there were different ways that I could maybe use the team to give me a bit more flexibility into Amoongus. So Taunt ended up being the solution to that for me. I felt like it was just a very good like boom, you know, you get taunted, you can't do anything with your Terra Water Moongus. And it was pretty good actually in Portland. Um, I did find that taunt was actually a pretty good, you know, option to have. I didn't click it super often, but it was still useful enough where like it definitely warranted its spot. Besides that, I didn't really change anything else because I felt pretty good about the team. So then after that, right, um, the team's still really strong. I'm still playing in a couple tournaments and then I play Hartford next, right? So Hartford is a regional after and I end up bringing it. I don't do as necessarily as well as I wanted to. Like I didn't finish terribly. I finished 10-4, but I did start to notice some issues with the team, right? So this is where basically I realized that like Tailwind with Talonflame was kind of a hard matchup for the team if it was leveraged properly. And besides that, like the team was the exact same as what I used to win Portland, right? Uh, I just found that like there were definitely just some issues with the team in terms of being able to deal with like Talonflame Tailwind and Murkrow Tailwind was pretty much an auto loss for this team, which uh, obviously like I was thinking of ways to try and fix it, but eventually, you know, you kind of realize that you have to give up some matchups. So yeah, Murkrow Tailwind with Taunt, like that was just kind of an auto loss for this team. Uh, if it wasn't an auto loss, it was like 95-5, like very in their favor. They have to make like a ton of mistakes and yeah. 
then you know going um going into the next tournament right obviously i didn't get to go to actually milwaukee because i was pretty much uh like i was pretty much at my dad's wedding i don't know why i'm saying it like that it was i was just at my dad's wedding and i was busy right so at milwaukee i kind of had an i kind of like was watching the stream i was like hmm would sun be good into this metagame or not and i noticed the trend in talent teams increasing right so on the milwaukee stream or on the hartford stream rather i remembered uh shy Liang playing versus james evans right and in the game he did really well with his team in the tailwind so i was kind of expecting to see more tailwind so i ended up going away from sun for fresno regionals ended up not performing as well as i uh, had wanted to so it was definitely giving me a lot to think about like going forward right now after this i was like okay so obviously like i want to go back to sun but what were some of the issues that i you know had in hartford and in the other tournaments that like kind of discouraged me from going with it now um one problem was a talon flame with tailwind next to specs fluttermane if they just click tailwind and terra fairy moonblast it's pretty rough for the team to deal with you don't really have a good defensive terra so going into puerto rico i made one change which was putting the poison terra on my jump luff to account for that and poison terror actually ended up being really good on pluff um i didn't really have as many issues into tailwind it was still tough but like it was like definitely hard right but still going into naic right i felt like the team was definitely missing something and that like talent teams were way harder than they had to be and like i could definitely make some changes to account for that so i actually got this idea so i played a set a while ago right versus um another player and in the set, I jokingly had put, like, Ice Shard on my Chen Pao um, to see if it would work. And I actually, like, super shut down Talonflame. But I ended up, like, chickening out of bringing it because uh, I like Taunt for Terra Water Moongus, right? And I was like, oh, I need it. So I was thinking about it more, and I figured out that, like, there are definitely ways where you can just set up lines where you could just beat a Moongus by, like, out damaging it, right? But um, being smarter about how you're cycling in your pluff or, like, you know, obviously getting yourself in positions where you could um, knock out the Amoongus easier. So I ended up changing the team and bringing it to NAIC. Now I finished top four at NAIC and the big changes I made, and I'm gonna be talking about the final version in a second, um, you know, all the sets and everything, is this version. So this version basically took the team and improved on it a lot in my opinion and was kind of the culmination of the time I spent using the team. Now, fundamentally, the Torkoal, the King Gambit, the Fluttermane, Great Dust, and Change, they all work the same, but Shin Pao ended up having Ice Shard and Crunch. Now, I cannot express how important these two changes were for the team overall, because what it allowed it to do is pressure into Tailwind matchups more, and also gave Chin Pao a priority option that could pressure along with really fast offense to really chip things down quickly, right? And then Crunch gave me another way to deal with Amoongus because what I could do is do Crunch plus Assurance into King, uh, with King Gambit into Amoongus's to knock it out. Now, you might notice, by the way, this is actually something I forgot to mention. Um, Assurance was a more recent change I made going into Hartford that just stuck with me and like was something I wanted to use going forward, right? Um, I found that assurance was a lot more helpful than Kowtow was. So now that now that I've kind of like gone through all the different versions, right? What is this team's general intention and like what makes it strong? So what I found was really strong about it when I had originally checked out the first version of the team, right? And I think it's cool to have a comparison between the first and the final version of the team, right? Is the team was really good at outputting a lot of offensive pressure. That was a really strong aspect of the team, right? what it could do is really force the opponent in the positions where they were forced to eat a lot of damage now what were some issues that i felt like needed to be solved that were solved by the final version first off tailwind was a huge problem for it stopping talent flame was really difficult right another thing too was when the flutter had terra water i ended up just instantly changing it to terra fairy because i just felt like it needed the extra damage output along with making sure it was a special attack boosting nature the King Gambit changed to Assurance because Assurance was good for stronger double ups, right? Eventually, that's what I settled on. And then also changing to Crunch and Ice Shard so that way I'd have a better Tailwind matchup. And then uh, changing the Torkoal to Fissure because Fissure could be used in a lot more situations when I was pinning the opponent. Now, another quick thing to talk about as well, right, is for example, like, okay, so I made like certain choices like Fissure and I also changed to Assurance, right? And then also I added, you know, Crunch and Ice Shard to the, to the pile, right? So the question is, right, is 
is it really that different of a team? And like, I cannot express how much those changes matter to making it a different team. The team plays entirely differently when you have those options available, right? And it just really goes to show you like how important those small changes can really be for the team. And I think that it's a really good, you know, almost eye opener for me that like sometimes it's not necessarily always about like making a brand new team. But taking a team that's worked and optimizing it and working on changes throughout the course of, you know, format or like the time playing the team and make it better and better. Because the more familiar I was with the team, also the better I was playing with it, I think. And uh, it definitely ended up like showing right in how I played it. So I think overall um, the team was very strong, right? You have a lot of combinations. You have your Torkoal, you have your Tusk. And I'm going to get more into the combinations and how you would play the team. But this is just kind of the overview of like how I went about some of the changes, how the process of the team went throughout the course of the format. So, um, yeah, let's get right into the, uh, Pokemon sets. And then we'll also get into the common leads approaches with the archetype as well. Chen Pao started as one of the Pokemon I really disliked on this team the most, and it eventually turned into what felt like one of the most powerful options, if not the most powerful option on the team. And I think it came from a combination of experience, but also some changes to the Pokemon to make it function better on the team. Now, Chin Pao was pretty crucial because it enabled Great Tusk and King Gambit. The physical damage uh, from the Sword of Ruin boost was actually a pretty big deal. It allowed King Gambit and Great Tusk to be outputting way more damage than you would, you know, normally expect from them. And that combined with the Sun boost, usually on both of them, with Terrifier, uh, Terra Blast on King Gambit. And then you have Sun up with that, so it does a bunch of damage. And then the Protosynthesis boost on the Great Tusk. It's really good for enabling even more damage on top of that to make it really hard for opponents to really just stop your damage output, right? Because you're just doing so much. And the really big combinations that you get out of the Terra Flying is the EQ and Ice Spinner. So you could do Scarf Great Tusk EQ and you can go for Ice Spinner. And Chin Pao was just super, super useful into a lot of like specific matchups because it could pin really well with the ground and ice coverage when it had Great Tusk next to it. And it also was incredibly useful with Ice Spinner into Psy Spam because you could clear the terrain and then Ice Shard so you could hit Talon with a Ice Shard and then follow up with a Great Tusk Scarf Rock Slide before Talon could even set up Tailwind, right? So it completely flipped the Tailwind matchup on its head. What was originally not a great matchup with Ice Shard was turned into a pretty strong matchup. Besides that, the moveset is pretty straightforward. Um, Crunch was really useful. I felt like even though uh, it's a very straightforward Pokemon, the moveset was actually very creative in terms of how it allowed the team to play. And Crunch was super useful because if you crunched into a Terra Water Amoongus with the Sword of Ruin boost, or I guess decrease for the defense, Assurance from King Gambit would also be able to knock out Amoongus without having to Terra Fire it, which actually came into play one of my rounds at NAIC. Um, overall too, Crunch is just a really nice move because the main drawback of Sucker Punch is it requires your opponents to attack, right? So just being able to have a straight up Crunch, I can attack you, you can't stop me, is pretty nice. And I already had Sucker Punch on King Gambit, so it didn't feel like too much of a drawback. And I also had Ice Shard as well, which was a good priority move that was pretty useful in most cases. So I was very happy with this Chen Pao set and these small, two small move changes completely changed how the Pokemon operated. It was incredibly strong. Great Tusk was definitely a really important member of the team as well, along with the Chin Pao, uh, mostly because of the synergy, as I kind of discussed it when I was talking about Chin Pao. But Great Tusk on its own just uh, outputted a lot of damage, and that mainly came from the combination of Protosynthesis plus Sword of Ruin. Uh, Protosynthesis was obviously the thing that was boosting it more often, but it was really just able to capitalize off of the boosts that were stacking with it to just really put out some crazy damage. I found that Great Tusk was incredibly good when you were leveraging it next to other really powerful attacks, right? So for example, Fluttermane's Dazzling Gleam, and then you have a Headlong Rush. It's really hard to switch into that unless you have something like a Gyarados, which in that case, you can always do something like a Rock Slide Dazzling Gleam. And it also gave me a really solid Chen Pao D Knight matchup. And the reason why was because you could lead Great Tusk and Fluttermane and just click Rock Slide and click Dazzling Gleam. And there wasn't really any good counterplay from Chin Pao D Knight into that because they couldn't knock out Great Tusk with a combination of Terra Normal Extreme Speed and Sucker. And Flutter was really bulky, so it could normally just survive. 
So that combination was actually really important and it was leveraged a lot. And that's where Great Tusk really shined besides like the other matchups where you just have like Ting Lu's that you need to get rid of. Um, especially in the balance teams, it felt pretty good. It felt really good into Iron Hands. Great Tusk ended up being just a really strong damage out option, right? Like you just need a strong physical sun abuser and Great Tusk filled that role. The Terra Fire was just so you couldn't get burned and also so you could resist um, he uh, fire moves from Chi Yu and also resist fairy moves from Flutter and it did its job, right? Adamant Nature was also pretty crucial over something like Jolly, even though you're underspeeding stuff like Scarf Tatsugiri, the damage difference is huge and it would allow you to get some KOs that were like absolutely ridiculous. Like um, with Great Tusk, one of the biggest like combinations you could do is if you had Sun active and then you also used Helping Hand with your Torkoal, um, Headlong Rush would just straight knock out an Amoongus, even if it was like uh, bold, like super bulky. So it just had a lot of synergy with the rest of the team and Great Tusk just felt incredibly good as long as it was used properly. Fluttermane was obviously a very integral part of the team. I don't think any regulation C team was able to really function super well without using Fluttermane. And that's just because its damage output is just so incredibly strong. And it was just a very, very big threat, you know, to a lot of Pokemon in the format. And it's just typing coverage is incredibly good. Choice Specs in general just really helped amplify its damage and it let me invest more into its bulk because if you think about it, right, you have the Protosynthesis special attack boost, you have the Specs boost, and then you have the Terra Fairy boost, right? So there were a lot of factors that were just allowing my Fluttermane to do more damage. So it allowed me to invest in the bulk, which allowed me to pretty much live like almost any physical attack in the metagame besides some stuff like Heavy Slam from, you know, Iron Hands or like Heavy Slam from Ting Lu. But those are things you expect to die to, right? Besides that, it was pretty much able to live like on, almost any single physical attack coming its way and it ended up being a really big deal um i even had a case in my portland run where i believe it was versus neil actually um it was terror dark sucker punch from chen pao it just did not kill my flutter and it was a very very big deal because the bulk on the flutter was very uncommon and it caught a lot of people off guard now also, the reason why you want the special attack boost over the speed boost on specs is because specifically for your Dozo matchup, but also just for other squishier teams, having the special attack boost plus the Terra Fairy is so insane. It, it like nukes teams. It can absolutely just change the pace of a game when your Dazzling Gleam does like 40% on a resisted hit. That's generous, by the way. If it's that's like I'm assuming like an Amoongus or something. If it's something that resists it that is not that bulky like an Amoongus, you're probably doing upwards of like 60, 70%, and it can really chunk some good damage. So Flutter was just incredibly strong. I, I was very, very impressed by Flutter, and it, it was never a bad slot on this team, right? As long as you used it properly, that was the main, you know, benefit from it. Now, the other thing that the speed investment is for is so that you can outspeed Adamant Dozo, Adamant Max Speed Dozo specifically, when Tatsugiri's, uh, you know, boosting it. And it's notably one point slower than Jump Luff. Um, that was important because Jump Luff Leaf Storm to break a Sash followed up by Moon Blast felt really important. And also too, there were some cases where like, you want to kind of have an idea of the speed tier of everything, right? So for example, if Jump Luff, right, is outspeeding another Flutter main, then you know that the Flutter main, right, on your side is potentially outspeeding them as well because they're slow enough to be outsped, right? So generally, I just felt like having them around the same speed tier was pretty helpful for me. And it, yeah, it just felt incredibly strong. I was a big fan of Flutter and I was not disappointed at all by what it was able to do for the team. King Gambit was easily the best member of this this team, like by far. King Gambit's been a Pokemon I've been very comfortable with the whole time I've been playing Scarlet and Violet, especially on a lot of teams. So it's no surprise that it was the best Pokemon on this team by far. Now that sounds weird because it is a Sun team, but I promise you King Gambit definitely delivered in terms of being the MVP in almost every game. I believe my bring rate of King Gambit to games was something like 97 to 98%. There was only a couple of sets where I did not bring King Gambit. Uh, by the end of like the tail end of using this team in tournament. King Gambit was just so incredibly strong and the situations where I didn't bring it, it was usually because I was bringing something like Torkoal, Jumpluff, Fluttermane, and Great Tusk. And those cases were very rare and I ended up leaning a lot more, a lot more towards King Gambit just later on um, using this team because it was so strong into so many teams. Uh, it was even good in matchups that theoretically you would think would be bad for it, but it was still good just because of its sheer damage output and what it could do. Now, 
Overall, King Gambit is just incredibly good because of its assault vest. Being able to sit in front of Flutters is a really big deal. The Terrifier lets you park it in front of Flutter and Chi Yu and pretty much be unthreatened by them. And being able to throw Iron Heads into Flutter is like a really big deal. Also, too, with the Terrifier, you could pressure in Sun like big KOs on stuff like Amoongus. And Terrifier Terror Blast chunks a lot of teams. Um, especially if you're in sun, right? Because you're just hitting them for so much damage, just even if it's neutral. And it was really good into other King Gambit. It was really good into just a bunch of other balanced teams. King Gambit to me was just like one, it was the most instrumental member of this team by far. Defiant was also really crucial because it prevents the eject pack on Torkoal from being exploited because you could switch it in to, you know, get the Defiant boost. And you could also just use it to kind of deter Intimidates going onto your Chin Pao or your Great Tusk or even switching it in on an Icy Wind. There were just so many different applications of ways you could use this King Gambit that made it integral to the rest of the team functioning. It was the best enabler for the rest of the team in terms of discouraging certain stat drops and everything from the opponent and then also is one of the best damage dealers by far and if you could support this thing properly with uh you know good damage even spread move damage supported it really well um you would be able to get a lot out of it and notably like assurance is super good because you have dazzling gleam and you can assurance right and or you have like rock slide you can assurance and you have you know just like other really good pins in that way and of course too um the main thing that made it super strong as well is just that even if you're doing single target moves like it's a really nasty pin and it's really hard to switch into because it just outputs so much damage now it's time to talk about the star of the show jump Luff obviously was the pokemon that everyone looked at and was like whoa this pokemon's super sick right uh jump Luff's a really cool pokemon i just think it's like a really unique pokemon in terms of what it offers and it just had a really good toolkit to really support this team, right? Jumpluff obviously isn't the best Pokemon in terms of its base stats, but it does make up for that in its speed tier and also to in its ability Chlorophyll, right? Chlorophyll is obviously the main thing that carries this Pokemon. It makes it uh, something that's actually bringable because of its unique speed tier plus the Chlorophyll, right? Terra also helped it a lot as well, and I think that was a big contributing factor. Now, what does Encore, or, like, what does Encore Jumpluff do versus like something like After You Lilligan, right? That you can use next to Torkoal. So Encore Jumpluff is really good because normally versus high damaging teams, what balanced teams or like more defensive teams will do is they'll go for protect, they'll go for like substitutes, they'll go for more plays that are basically slowly building up momentum or trying to pretty much like get you in positions where like you've wasted your sun turns. Now, what Jump Luff does really well is it basically says, okay, well, you can't protect in front of me because if you do, I'm going to Encore you and you're going to waste your turn. And also, too, if they lock in the status move that's maybe not as useful, like Swords Dance um, or a Substitute, something like that, you can just Encore them into it, and that's really difficult. Now, there's also some other uses of Encore, which is, uh, you know, where you get, like, more specific. So, for example, if you catch a Dondozo that's in on its own using something like Terra Blast Grass to try and hit one of your Pokemon for a lot of damage or, like, Wave Crash, right, you can Encore it into that, and now they're kind of in this really ugly loop where they can't output enough damage because uh, they, they're stuck into using one move that's like not hitting your jump off for a lot. Encore just had so many applications that made it like incredibly good. Then Tailwind obviously just speeds up your team. I mentioned how my Flutter was very bulky and how I leveraged, you know, the extra bulk to allow it to survive hits. And the reason why I didn't need to be so speed investment was because of Tailwind, right? Tailwind allowed it to move faster. Sleep Powder was really good as well. Obviously, in bad matchups, you can kind of just throw Sleep Powder into teams that aren't really prepared for it. You also have it for teams that don't respect Sleep Powder, right? And then also to, uh, it was just an incredibly useful move, obviously, for outputting a lot of pressure. Sometimes, like, just having Sleep Powder really messes with your opponent because they're like, oh, they're going to click Sleep Powder. I have to counter it. You could just not click Sleep Powder, right? Um, so it's just incredibly useful a move. And then Leaf Storm actually was really, really useful in Jump Luff. Um, it's a really good chunk move, even though Jump Luff's special attack is not really that great at all. Um, Leaf Storm can actually do a good chunk of damage into a lot of Pokemon, right? Like on a Amoongus, you could do like 40% if they were Terra Watered, and then follow up with Assurance from King Gambit, and you could normally like knock it out, right? Um, or you could hit like an Iron Bundle that has no bulk and just knock it out straight up, right? So there were a lot of good applications for it. Covert Cloak was also really big too. Um, people who were using other items on Jump Luff, I think, just made it worse because you need the Covert Cloak so you can't get pressured by Fake Out. And also, too, it lets you sit in front of Fake Out and Encore them in the Fake Out on that turn, right? Or like click Sleep Powder if you want. And it ended up coming into play a lot versus 
all the rain matchups I actually played on stream at NAIC, because they couldn't fake me out with Iron Hands, it made it a lot tougher for them to kind of maneuver the situations. Um, and yeah, Jumpluff was just a really good Pokemon. Uh, Terra Poison was also really important um, versus Tailwind teams. Um, if they had Flutter in the right position where they could just Terra Fairy and just spam Fairy moves, uh, Terra Poison allowed me to counter that. It didn't come into play that much because usually you want to be tearing your other slots, but I found it was more useful than Terra Water on this team. I guess you can make an argument between the both, but I personally like Terra Poison a little bit more. So last but not least, Torkoal was an incredibly strong member of this team, obviously. It's a Sun team, so obviously without Sun, it's not super great. Torkoal was just incredibly good at enabling the rest of the team. I think the main thing that differentiated this Torkoal from other Torkoals you've seen on previous Sun teams is the Eject Pack. So Eject Pack's a really insane item because it allows you to actually get a pivot out with your Torkoal with Overheat, which is actually really strong into a lot of teams. Now, the main drawback that people always point out in the Eject Pack uh, eject pack is that if someone switches in an intimidate mon right uh, you obviously are forced to switch out now that's kind of where King Gambit was there to nullify you know obviously the weakness in the Torkoal's eject pack so uh, you know that was kind of the synergy there but eject pack is super nice because essentially you can set Sun click overheat bring in another a Pokemon that can take advantage of the Sun with protosynthesis and you're immediately doing damage and then if Torkoal stayed in you could go for a strong helping hands to help enable your partners to do a lot Torkoal on its own doesn't really do that much and it can obviously be a momentum killer if it's stuck on the field doing nothing so that's where the choice for fissure came fissures actually a really strong move on Torkoal, and I think that people were definitely underrating it. Um, stuff like Yawn and other moves don't really generate much momentum, and the reason why is because, in the end, they're going to be switching around because you're hitting them with big moves anyways, right? Uh, Yawn is kind of a temporary solution, whereas Fissure always gives you a strong way to win the game if you're desperate, right? So, think about it like this, right? I could have Yawn over Fissure, but maybe I'm forcing some swaps, but they're already being forced to swap anyways. And it kind of goes against how the Torkoal is being run anyways, because you're clicking overheats, you're clicking helping hands a lot, right? So naturally, there's only like two moves that would reasonably make sense. Clear Smog to make Dozo easier, or Fissure, which is kind of like a 30% get out of jail free card in any bad matchup, right? So to me, I found like there was more value with Fissure, because in the situations where you want to use Fissure, right? Um, if you're playing or if you're playing optimally with the team right you're never actually clicking fissure until it's like a last resort kind of thing so having a 30 percent chance to win the game even if you got outplayed is pretty crazy to me right and i think it makes it really strong also too um there were certain cute things you could do so versus dondozos if they locked into earthquake i would tear flying my torkoal and have jump fluff in and just encore them in the earthquake and just spam fissure until i connected on it right um and like that's at that point right like they put themselves in that situation plus it's like it's not like you're lucking them, right? Because it's basically just spamming Fissure until you hit it. So your odds are pretty good to hit it. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty strong matchup into that specifically. Encore plus like Fissure was actually really oppressive into a lot of teams. And then Sleep Powder plus Fissure, right? Um, I found it to be really useful. And then the bulk on the Torkoal was really nice too because it could kind of just sit around. So like if you weren't targeting Torkoal, it had multiple opportunities to go for Fissures if it wasn't clicking overheat and helping hand, right? The special defense was really big because you could live pretty much any hit from Flutter main, uh, even like special attack boosted modest 252 shadow ball with specs um, from opposing Flutter, you would live it with your Torkoal. So it was a really big deal. And then finally, the speed um, might look a bit surprising to people, but being able to outspeed Amoongus with no speed investment was a really big deal. So it's actually really funny because a lot of the friends I've talked to or like other players I talked to actually put speed on their Amoongus to counter this specific Torkoal because my Torkoal was moving before Amoongus is, right? And it actually really matters. So um, yeah, it was it was a really nice uh, option on the Torkoal, especially because you could just, you know, fast phase out overheat. But yeah, I was very proud of the Torkoal, and I think it was a very, very good enabler for the rest of the team. In this section, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the common approaches and ways that I approach the games with the cores that I was using in the team, and also to just some combinations to kind of, you know, give you guys a bit more context on how the team functions overall, right? So the first uh, combo you see here is the Chin Pao and Great Tusk Lead. You could immediately start by terraflying your Chin Pao and going for an Earthquake, right? 
um, and just going for an ice spinner that was really helpful into a lot of teams. But I found myself using this lead a lot into Tailwind teams. And the main reason why was because I could just ice shard into Talonflame to break the Gale Wings and then immediately go for Rock Slide with Grey Tusk and just knock out Talonflame immediately. So this core here was really something that I brought into Tailwind majority of the time. I didn't end up playing versus a lot of Talonflame teams where this uh, ended up being a really, really good lead. And um, this lead also was pretty good into mouse ape as well because you could immediately just pressure a close combat into the mouse hold, force a terror ghost, and then you could just crunch into it anyways, right? Um, or you could just headlong and attack. Like you had a lot of different combinations of moves. And King Game would give you a free swap into Flutter if like they led something like Flutter main. Then for the uh, Torkoal and King Gambit lead, this was a lead that I found myself leading into teams that where you figured they were going to lead Intimidate immediately, and even if they didn't lead Intimidate, it would just benefit you to power up your Gambit earlier. This lead is something that I definitely used into Chi Yu and um, Fluttermane a lot, because you can immediately just terrify your Gambit, click Iron Head into the opposing uh, Fluttermane, and then go for an Overheat, cycle out your Torkoal into the Great Tusk or like whatever is appropriate, and then you can uh, pressure the Chi Yu with a bunch of damage so it felt very useful and i found myself using it a lot um and in general too king gambit torkoal is just a very safe lead into a lot of teams right uh torkoal is just really good at enabling the king gambit's terrifier terror blast and then you know if you bring in something like a chin pow you do more damage or you bring in tusk and if you bring in tusk what you can do is then because king gambit's on the field they're discouraged from intimidating you so you could just immediately switch your king gambit into chin pow to boost your tusk damage even more sun protosynthesis boost and you have chin pow active you're doing a bunch of damage and it just makes it really hard for them to bring an intimidate on you right and that's the whole idea with it um then we have our torkoal jump off lead Torkoal Jumpluff was just really good in the teams that just didn't have a good answer or didn't have a good Intimidator for like fast speed control Jumpluff, right? Um, basically what you could do with the Jumpluff Torkoal is just spread sleep powders immediately, put on a ton of pressure. It was something that you could use a lot to really threaten opposing teams that just didn't have any sleep answers. And then Fluttermane and Tusk were just good cleanup options at the back, assuming you land all your powders, right? And then you could just, um, or if you go for Tailwind, right? And then you could just capitalize with the Tusk and Flutter and just sweep through the team. Then you have Jump Off Torkoal, but this time it's Great Tusk and King Gambit in the back. I found myself using this into balance a couple times. Um, what you would do, and this is usually so you could steal a game one, right? Is you could lead Jump Off and Torkoal and immediately switch in King Gambit for your um, for your Jump Off. Now this sounds weird, right? But let's say they lead something like Ting Lu Amoongus, right? So if they lead Ting Lu Amoongus, what they can do is they can spore into your Torkoal slot and they can immediately just switch in Intimidate, right? To force your eject pack out. So you would force, or like you would make them want to like go for Intimidate there. And you would switch in King Gambit for Jump Luff. You would get the Defiant boost as they switch in the Intimidator. And then as your Torkoal eject packs out, you bring in Jump Luff to absorb the spore. So now you have a Jump Luff with Chlorophyll active, being able to use Sleep Powder and or tailwind whatever you want and then you have a plus one king gambit on the field that you can tear fire to avoid a burn if it's arcanine or if it's gyarados you can just leave there and click sleep powder like whatever you want right so overall this combination was incredibly potent and i found that like it was super super useful right and then you obviously have tusk in the back to help deal with you know the fire types that you might have trouble dealing with with the torkoal and the jump luff and it was just a very strong concept right uh, i found that you could really take advantage of a lot of the momentum that a jack pack netted you with this team and that's what made it so unique and like really strong with its offense Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you guys would like to support me beyond, you know, obviously the YouTube videos and everything else, make sure to check me out on my other socials. Make sure to check me out on Twitch. Also make sure to check out the Patreon. The Patreon obviously is super helpful for me, allows me to keep making content, and I incredibly appreciate all support. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for all the support. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.